About 10 years ago, we began our journey into a dark and inhospitable world, a hostile realm where corruption and greed turned kings into monsters, and where hope was a half-remembered dream. Also, some of us played Dark Souls. Yes, it was the decade of Dark Souls, and the Dark Souls of decades. It totally permeated the collective gamer unconscious. It just couldn't be ignored. From Software created this new strain of super hard action RPGs as a deliberate counterpoint to modern design sensibilities. It's a series that, for better and for worse, changed the way games are played, made, and talked about. So, before the ember of discourse fades, sit down by the bonfire light of your computer, tablet device, or mobile phone. And for one last time, listen to a man talk at you about Dark Souls for entirely too long. Did you know that the first Souls game wasn't Dark Souls, but 2009's Demon Souls? Dark Souls people know this, and they love telling non-Dark Souls people. Demon Souls established a template that From Software would follow with some alterations for three Dark Souls games, as well as Bloodborne and Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. We'll refer to these collected works as Souls games. Souls games will usually check the following boxes. RPG mechanics, minimalist storytelling, methodical combat, which means no animation canceling and long animations, and stamina management, except in Sekiro where your protagonist is all hopped up on Demerol and Baja Blast, big scary bosses, limited healing items, a swamp full of poison, obtuse multiplayer, open-ended exploration, dying a lot, death penalties, manual checkpoints, and every single person you meet sounding like they've had a handful of zannies. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what a Souls game is. But why a Souls game is. <laughs> Follow. Souls games were a deliberate antidote to the prevailing game design sensibilities. In an interview after the release of Demon Souls, which was actually the first Souls game, series creator Hidetaka Miyazaki said their goal was to stay clear of current trends, and felt that the game was something the games industry needed, much like a teenaged me wearing flame pattern Chuck Taylors a decade after the collapse of Third Wave Ska, the Souls franchise refused to do anything that could be considered appropriate for the era in which it lived. It seems like for each critical piece of game design, the team would look at how things were being done and then not do that, either adapting some old school mechanic from days of gaming past or coming up with something totally new. Starting with controls. Right here is where the developer of pretty much every third-person action game puts the important stuff. You use your thumb to smash jump and attack and heavy attack, uh, and the triggers are the buttons where developers would put miscellaneous stuff like lock-on, magic spells, or block, the coward's buttons. But Dark Souls turned them into warrior's buttons. The change is a practical consideration. It lets you attack without taking your thumb off the right stick which is critical for maneuvering and not falling off of things. But it's also an idiosyncrasy that would come to define the games. When I first played Dark Souls, I thought there was no way that control scheme could be right, and I tried to remap it. And then I realized I was the one who was wrong. They also forged their own path with their treatment of teaching. In 2001, Halo Combat Evolve taught us that even the most grizzled space marines still need someone to tell them how to look up or down. This generous, borderline condescending tutorialization became an unshakable trend. To this day, a video game hero's journey always begins when they cross the threshold to adventure by passing under a fallen tree, crouching for the first time in their heroic lives. Dark Souls, on the other hand, teaches players to survive the way my father taught me how to mow the lawn. That is, by looking at me and saying, Patrick, go mow the lawn. Like dads everywhere, Souls games were determined to foster a sense of independence, especially when it comes to navigation. Most games of the era were giving players tools to get exactly where they needed to be. 
action games drew players from area to area, guiding them with clever lighting, AI companions, or sometimes just UI waypoints plastered all over the screen. And in open world games used detailed maps and GPS systems that told you not just where to go, but how to get there. Which was kind of a bummer. I spent way too much of GTA and Red Dead Redemption staring at the lower right corner of the screen, instead of the very pretty environment. Souls games would replace GPS systems with another system, where if you go the wrong way, you get killed by 100 skeletons. None of these games feature detailed maps or waypoints. Instead, you're asked to explore on your own. And when your exploration leads you down a ladder into a deadly rat mosh pit, you'll get acquainted with another thing Souls games do differently. Checkpointing. In the 2010s, manual saving was out, and checkpointing was in. Instead of using save rooms or asking you to use a save menu, most games said, we'll do it for you. Saving happens quietly in the background, and in a game like Last of Us, it makes sense. It's a story-driven game, and when your character experiences the first tender moments of an ultimately doomed love, you don't want to worry about mashing that quick save button. The idea is that when you die, you immediately load back up just moments before you goof. You can push through the game without losing much progress. It's a system designed to minimize friction. So of course, Dark Souls said fuck that. The games use manual checkpoints called bonfires or lanterns or shrines that let you know exactly where you'd go back to if you died. You'd lose any souls you'd gathered and every enemy you killed would come back to life. The rules were perfectly clear. And to the furtive millennial, the fear of venturing out into an uncertain, hostile world, fucking up, losing all of your money, and moving back home was hashtag relatable. Which brings me to storytelling. The biggest games of the last decade brought in serious actors and stuck little tiny balls all over their faces with the goal of telling more personal, human stories. They promised twists and subversions and shocking conclusions. Others featured indexes overflowing with explanations of the world's details. Once again, Dark Souls quietly mumbled, no. Souls games keep it vague, and I mean really vague. If you talk to a lot of NPCs, read a lot of item descriptions, or watch a lot of YouTube videos, you can piece together a greater narrative. But it's also entirely possible to experience these games as tone pieces, where you move through the world and feel things, usually different flavors of discomfort. Each environment hints at a story that'll never be told in detail. The horrifying aftermath of a witch hunt seen in the next morning's light. A civilization clinging to life in the most precarious place imaginable. A beautiful monastery with dark secrets. There's a ton of power in not telling people what the fuck something is. I don't need to know what the Kessel Run is and why it's impressive that Han Solo made it in under 12 parsecs, and I think it's better if I don't. Last, but not least, the coup de grace of Dark Souls. Bosses. Let's take a look at some of the top reviewed games of the aughts and look at how they handled bosses. Red Dead Redemption, no bosses. Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, bad bosses. GTA V, no bosses. Batman Arkham Asylum, bad bosses. Mass Effect 2, no bosses. And then bad bosses. I don't want to be reductive and say that bosses were totally out of fashion. Some games like Bayonetta were still holding it down. But in the beginning of the decade, lots of big games were moving in the direction of delivering a seamless gameplay and narrative experience and we're reckoning with how boss fights, an inherently disruptive mechanic, fit into that smooth ride. Dark Souls said they are the ride, and you're going to die on this ride. All of these reversals can be best summarized by something I call unease of use. Most of the innovations of this decade have been solely aimed at making our lives easier by capitalizing on our most minor discomforts, selling us the promise of an easy life, ordering food, calling a cab, buying candles without ever getting anxiety. Perhaps Miyazaki saw the decade's trajectory and wished to remind us of what it felt like to be sometimes inconvenienced, lest we grow too complacent and disconnected from the world. But I think he was probably just being an asshole. AAA game devs were honing game experiences, making them smoother and more seamless, and making sure the player always knew where they should be going and what they should be doing at any given moment. For a lot of us, that was helpful and satisfying. But Souls games were looking to scratch a different kind of itch. And as it turns out, lots of people had that itch.
Whether or not Souls games were really a new genre or a potent combination of resurfaced ideas, they resonated with a lot of people. Critics, YouTubers, and online people kept talking about these old school, unpleasant, ugly games that you absolutely needed to play. And normal people would look at them for a few minutes and say, Really? But there was no denying their success. The series has sold over 25 million copies. They won awards. And they caught on, especially with the people who make games. Their shape, texture, and flavor would resurface in the works of innovators and imitators. Lords of the Fallen was the first one of the list. It added a dialogue system, and the Souls likes would continue, each one of them tweaking the formula a little bit. Robot Souls, Ninja Souls, Cartoon Souls, Anime Souls, Karate Souls, Garbage Souls, Cartoon Souls 2, Guns Souls. And the core mechanics and themes would be adapted back into 2D, landing somewhere between Dark Souls and classic games like Castlevania or Metroid. Extra Goth Souls, Bug Souls, Catholic Souls. And that's not to mention the score of indie and early access tributes on Steam. And last but not least, other long-running franchises adopted Soulsian touches, because things that are meant to counter the mainstream can be welcomed into the mainstream. In Assassin's Creed Origins and Odyssey, Ubisoft moved the attack buttons from the face buttons to the right triggers, borrowed the Souls lock-on system, and increased the emphasis on well-timed dodges. God of War made this shift as well, even adding some boss encounters that would have felt right at home in a Souls game. Tell me this big swordsman is not a Dark Soul. Darksiders 3 was developed with a more measured, Souls-inspired combat design, but since their franchise was historically more of a hack and slash, there was a hack and slash backlash, and they ended up patching in a classic mode. Also, Star Wars is a Dark Souls now. Sorry. While we're comparing things to Dark Souls, let's talk about one of the greatest cultural impacts of Dark Souls. Comparing things to Dark Souls. Dark Souls became a convenient shorthand for describing a certain type of game, specifically one that used any mechanic that was in a Souls game. Even if that mechanic wasn't invented by Dark Souls, any game with stamina management or obtuse hidden lore became a Dark Souls. This is absurd. It would be like referring to every non-linear gear-gated platformer as a Metroidvania. Oh. This is mostly okay. Uh, comparisons are super valuable in helping people understand new games, but sometimes people would use Dark Souls to just mean hard, which is wrong. And which brings us to our current topic, getting mad about the misapplication of the Dark Souls descriptor. This is something that you could do in the Dark Souls of decades, and a lot of people chose to do it. It was a pedantic response that furthered the public perception that these games and their community were hostile and unwelcoming, which sucks. And which brings us to our next topic, getting mad about getting mad about the misapplication of the Dark Souls descriptor. Getting mad about getting mad about getting mad about the misapplication of the Dark Souls descriptor. Getting mad about getting mad about getting mad about getting mad about the misapplication of the Dark but Souls back to the thing about the hostility of Souls fans. Souls games would become part of something that was really big during the Dark Souls of decades gatekeeping. And I'm not just talking about the foggy kind. Dark Souls became a litmus test of who was and wasn't a real gamer. It was a showcase of skill and authenticity. Hard games weren't new, but suddenly we had easier access to platforms that would let real gamers flex. Before Twitch and YouTube, playing games much like using the toilet or performing nostril hair maintenance was something to be done in the privacy of your own metaphorical or literal bathroom. But since it was the Dark Souls of decades, the once hollowed bathroom of gaming was thrown open to the world, and web video platforms would become one of the chief places to show off, scrutinize, or be scrutinized. While the game's obtuse nature drew people together to map out its mechanics and secrets and strategies, it's impossible to ignore the toxic elements of its community. Get Good became an unsympathetic, trollish reply to people who admitted to having a hard time with the games. A bit ironic considering the games have built-in cooperation mechanics. The anonymous cooperative elements of the games were inspired by events in Miyazaki's life where strangers came together to help one another, knowing that their relationships were entirely transient, which makes it all the more tragic that lots of people turned the games into a signifier of rugged individualism and personal accomplishment. But that's the disparity of Dark Souls. Dark Souls can be a big nude man who invades your game and stabs you in the butt, or Dark Souls can be a big nude man who invades your game and helps you kill God.
Dark Souls taught us that sometimes the path forward won't be clear, that sometimes it's okay to be uncomfortable, and that it's always okay to ask for help. And now, perhaps we can learn from the game one last time, and let the first flame of discourse go unlinked. What I'm saying is, now that the Dark Souls of Decades is over, we never have to talk about it again. And if you see somebody talking about Dark Souls Online after this published date, link them to this video and tell them to stop.